Hey there, just a heads up, this episode of the Judo Science Podcast was created with help from AI. Some of the voices you'll hear are synthetic, but the ideas come from real research and real judo. Ever watch someone execute a judo throw and just you know, marvel at it? It looks almost, I don't know, magical sometimes. Yeah, seamless, like one fluid, powerful motion. Exactly. But what you're seeing is really just the surface, isn't it? Yeah. There's this whole complex biomechanical process hidden underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot going on. So today on the deep dive, we're going to uh, so peel back that surface. We want to explore the fundamental principles, the physics, really, that make these throws so effective and efficient. Exactly. We're diving into the biomechanics of judo throwing. We'll be focusing specifically on those really crucial phases before the actual throw happens. You mean the uh, the unbalancing part and getting into position? And precisely. The unbalancing and then the entry or fitting phase. Yeah. And yeah, our analysis, it's all based on findings from biomechanical studies. Okay. So our mission today really is to give everyone a clearer picture of the how. How does a judo throw actually work, mechanically speaking? Right. Moving beyond just knowing the names of the throws. Yeah, getting into the mechanics underneath. And whether you actually practice judo or maybe you're just, you know, fascinated by how the human body moves, mm -hmm. we think this will offer some, well, pretty valuable insights. Definitely. And it's worth pointing out, you know, judo techniques have traditionally been classified in different ways. Like hand techniques, hip techniques, leg techniques that kind of thing. Yeah, or even that classic breakdown, unbalance, entry, throw, which well, is useful, of course. But biomechanics offers a different angle. A different perspective, yeah. A more fundamental one, really, based on physics. Okay, so where do we start with that? Well, biomechanical analysis has identified something called action invariant. Action invariant. That's These are basically fundamental connected movements they consistently show up in the unbalancing and entry phases across lots of different throws. So, like, the building block. That's a great way to think of it, yeah. The oh. basic building blocks. And we can sort of group them into two main types. Right. General action invariance and specific action invariance. Okay. General action invariance first, then. What do those cover? So, these are about the big picture. Your whole body's motion during that unbalancing and entry specifically um, how you shorten the distance between you and your opponent. Ah, uh, closing the gap. Exactly. And research has found basically three main ways this happens. First, just shortening the distance directly without much rotation. Straight in. Pretty much. Second, shortening the distance while doing a full rotation that could be anywhere from, say, zero up to 180 degrees. Okay, big term. And the third is shortening the distance with more of a half rotation, maybe zero to 90 degrees. Got it. And it's important to remember these angles, they're usually described for athletes starting still. In a real match, things are way more dynamic, obviously. Right, things change constantly. Yeah. Okay, so those are the general ones, big movements, closing distance. What about specific action invariance? Okay, so the specific ones are more about the details, the coordinated movements of your upper body and your lower body. The kinetic chains, is that the term? Exactly, the kinetic chains, like how your arms, torso, legs, hips all link up and work together. These specific action invariants are also about getting the right posture during unbalancing and entry. So they're more tailored. Yeah, more tailored to certain types of throws. They help you fine tune things for that specific technique. Okay, so if I'm understanding this, yeah, the whole throw, you know, from starting the unbalance right through to the execution, it feels like one smooth movement. It absolutely is. It's a single, integrated, skilled action. And earlier biomechanical studies recognized that too. But breaking it down with these action invariants helps us understand the mechanics better. Right. Like seeing the component. Precisely. By looking at it through this lens of general and specific action invariants, we get a much clearer view of the fundamental mechanical steps. What's really going on? You can see the connections between different throws, maybe. Yes. You start to see the underlying similarities and also the key differences between techniques that might look quite different on the surface. Okay. Let's dig into that unbalancing phase then. People always say it's critical. How does biomechanics view its importance? Well, generally speaking, yes. Making your opponent lose their balance is uh, pretty key, a prerequisite for most successful throws. Generally, so not always. Interestingly, no. 
There are certain throws, sometimes called couple techniques. Couple techniques, like a pair. Yeah, think of applying a balanced pair of opposing forces. Sometimes these can actually work even without a really obvious, distinct unbalancing action first. Huh, how so? Especially if the opponent is already a bit unstable, maybe shifting their weight. In those cases, the forces you apply can work with gravity to help rotate them around their center of mass. So for some throws, you don't need that big initial off-balancing move. For some, yes. They're less reliant on it, but that's quite different from what we call physical lever throws. Okay, lever throws, like using your body as a lever. Exactly. And these throws almost always need both general and specific action invariants to work. For these, getting a really precise unbalance is essential. You need to disrupt their stability to create that leverage point. That makes intuitive sense. You can't use a lever effectively if the thing you're lifting is completely stable. Right. You need to destabilize it first. So what about the next step? The entry or fitting phase? Yeah. Getting into position, how does that fit with these action invariants? Right, the entry. Moving in, setting up the throw. That part is necessary for all types of throws. You always have to enter. Okay. And during this phase, you're doing two main things biomechanically. You're shortening the distance. That's the general action invariance we talked about. Right, closing the gap. And you're also establishing the correct body posture to actually execute the throw. So the general ones get you close. Yes. They handle the overall body movement to get you into proximity. But then for those physical lever throws we just mentioned, uh -huh. the entry phase also involves those specific action invariants. The fine tuning movements. Exactly. Those unique upper body and lower body movements that adjust your position just so, preparing you to apply the force effectively. And Honestly, these specific action invariants, they're often what give the different throws their names in judo. Uh, okay. So the specific way you use your arms or legs during the entry differentiates the techniques. Very often, yes. And we can even break those specific action invariants down further. How so? Into the upper body chain and the lower body chain. The upper and lower body, okay. The upper body chain, arms, shoulders, torso is usually about applying the main force for the throw, generating that power. Right. While the lower body chain legs, hips is often crucial for creating a stable base or maybe acting as the fulcrum for the lever. The pivot point. Exactly. And the really critical thing is both chains have to work together. Smoothly coordinated, harmony between the upper and lower body is key. This is really starting to paint a clearer picture. Can we maybe look at some actual throws, see how these general and specific invariants combine? Absolutely. Let's take an example. Remember that full rotation general action invariant, turning 0 to 180 degrees as you close in. Yeah, the big rotation. Okay. Now, combine that same general movement with different lower body chain actions. Specifically, think about how high or low you position your hips and legs relative to your opponent. Okay. If you stay upright, it might lead to a standing shoulder throw. If you drop your hips significantly lower, maybe a drop shoulder throw, go even lower, perhaps ending up kneeling or seated, and you get a seated shoulder throw. Wow. Okay. So the same fundamental rotation, but the specific leg hip action changes the outcome, changes the named throw. Precisely. The general invariant provides the foundation. The specific invariant provides the variation. So, you know, for someone training, understanding that core rotational movement is fundamental to mastering all those variations. That's really insightful. Okay, what about the first general one you mentioned? Just shortening the distance directly, no big rotation. Right, the direct approach. If you combine that direct closing of distance with different lower body chain movements, focusing on how you interact with the opponent's leg, you might get something like a foot sweep at the ankle level. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a wheel throw where you lift their leg higher and turn them. Or even a circle throw, perhaps stepping around them to off-balance them using their leg. So again, the same basic approach, straight in, but different specific leg actions create different throws. You got it. The direct entry is common. The specific application with the legs differs. And the half rotation, that zero to 90 degree turn. Good question. Combine that half rotation general action invariant, again, maybe with lower body chain actions moving bottom up, and you could get classic throws like a body drop or a leg wheel or a major wheel. It really shows how these fundamental patterns combine, doesn't it? It does. You see the building blocks combining in different ways. You also mentioned some lever techniques where the upper body is more dominant. Could you give an example there? Yeah, sure. Think about throws like the floating drop or maybe the corner drop. These often rely very heavily on the upper body chain specific invariants. Why is that? 
Well, often in these throws, there's less direct body-to-body -body contact compared to, say, a hip throw. Okay. So because of that reduced contact, getting the unbalancing perfect is absolutely critical. Your foot might just be acting as a small pivot point against the mat. Like a small fulcrum. Exactly. So you need really precise angles when you unbalance them. Think about trying to lift something heavy with a very short lever. It's hard, right? You need maximum efficiency. These throws are similar. The unbalancing needs to be just right because the leverage isn't coming from massive body contact. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So this difference between couple techniques and physical lever techniques seems really, really fundamental. Can we just clarify that distinction one more time? Yeah, it's a key takeaway. So a couple of forces techniques. They might not need a distinct separate unbalancing phase. They can often be done while both athletes are moving at various speeds, and they tend to apply force along one of the body's main symmetry planes. Symmetry planes, you mean like forward, backward, side to side? Exactly. The sagittal plane, which is forward and backward movement, like a lunge or squat. The transverse plane, which is rotational, like twisting your torso. And the frontal plane, which is side to side, like a side step. Can you give some quick examples for each plane? Just yes. illustrate. Sure. Sagittal plane. Think major outer reaping maybe going forwards or backwards, mm -hmm. or sweeping hip throw, which is kind of an inverse movement. Inner side reaping fits here too. Okay, transverse plane, rotation. Major inner reaping, minor inner reaping, often done attacking opposite sides. Got it. And frontal, side to side. Following foot sweep is a good example. Again, often attacking opposite sides. Minor outer reaping too. So with these couple techniques, the emphasis is more on applying those balanced forces correctly within the plane, sometimes without needing that big initial destabilization. So maybe a bit more adaptable if you haven't achieved perfect unbalance yet. Potentially, yes. Now compare that again to the physical lever techniques. Right. The contrast. They do require that unbalancing. They often need a brief pause or a moment where the movement kind of stills so you can establish the lever properly. Setting the fulcrum. Exactly. And they demand much more precise coordination between the upper and lower body kinetic chains to work, get the timing or position slightly wrong, and the lever just doesn't function effectively. So generally more complex to execute? Generally, yes. They're often more complex motor skills, and probably because of that complexity and the forces involved, they tend to use more energy too. Mm -hmm. Understanding this reliance on unbalancing for lever throws really highlights why disrupting your opponent's stance early is so important. It really does. Yeah. This whole biomechanical view, it seems like it offers a lens not just for individual throws, but for the whole interaction in a match. We've looked at the mechanics of one throw, but maybe zoom out slightly. How does this play out between two people actually competing? That's a great point. We can absolutely apply these ideas to the interaction. You can even think about studying the two athletes as a single system. The couple of athletes system, you might call it. Okay, the two judoka interacting as one system. Yeah. And when you look at it like that, the overall movement during a fight, it can seem chaotic, but it often has this surprising stability. It's almost like um, Brownian motion. Like random particle movement. Kind of. You have all these random seeming pushes and pulls from both athletes influencing the overall movement, but somehow the system often stays in a sort of stable equilibrium, at least momentarily. So amidst all the pushing, pulling, gripping, there's an underlying balance to the interaction. Often, yes. And those unbalancing movements, the entries we've been discussing, they're all happening within that dynamic interaction. The constant struggle for position, the attempts to disrupt the other person's balance, it's all part of managing this couple of athletes system. Fascinating. This has been a really uh, illuminating deep dive into the biomechanics behind judo throws. To sort of bring it all together, what are the main things you hope our listeners take away? Well, I think the key points are first understanding how we can break down these complex throws using biomechanics, looking at those fundamental general and specific action invariants during the unbalancing and entry phases. Right, the building blocks. Exactly. And second, really grasping that fundamental difference between the couple of forces techniques and the physical lever techniques. Especially regarding the need for unbalancing. Right. And the complexity. Precisely. Couple techniques might not always need distinct unbalancing, can work at different speeds. Lever techniques almost always need unbalancing, often require more precise coordination, maybe a brief pause. And getting this deeper understanding, you know, moving past just memorizing technique names, mm -hmm. it really gives you insight into why things work, why some throws are more efficient, perhaps, or why certain setups are crucial. Absolutely. 
For anyone involved in judo, thinking about, say, those fundamental ways of closing distance, the general action and variance, can really inform how they train and drill various techniques that share that same foundation. It provides a more, well, fundamental way to look at the movement itself. It does. It helps appreciate both the art and the science within judo. So thinking about these principles, yeah. it kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? what other complex human movements, maybe in other sports or even just everyday actions, could also be broken down into similar fundamental action and variant. That's a great thought. Once you start looking for the underlying physics and coordination. You might see them everywhere, right? Yeah, you might indeed. Well, hopefully this deep dive has given everyone a new perspective on the uh, really intricate biomechanics at play in judo. Yeah, hopefully leaving folks with a greater appreciation for the incredible science behind this amazing martial art and sport.